So I've been working with INET for a little while now. And a few years ago, I moved to San Francisco. And being in the heart of Silicon Valley, I realized that there was a need for an entirely different kind of new economic thinking. And that was coming from the world of tech. So I'd like to start by defining deep technology. Technology that is sufficiently profound so as to require and or create profound shifts in jurisprudence, culture, markets, law, or human life cycle planning. And I want us to think about what we know about how Facebook, Google, Amazon have changed our lives. Let me give you an example. Um, some of you have heard the name Lena Khan. She is a lawyer who is perhaps the most prominent face of the Neo-Brandeisian movement in law. And this movement was coming in response to the law and economics movement that came out of Chicago with Robert Bork really shifting our notions of what antitrust meant, for example. And what Lena Khan started pointing out is that if you look at the platforms that we have today, for example, Amazon, we can't think about monopolies in the same way that we used to think about them in the 1950s and the 1960s, because today's monopolies look very different. So Amazon is not necessarily competing on price in the same area where it has a monopoly. If you think about Google, for example, Google has maybe not a monopoly, but is very, very um, dominant in the area of search. So if we think of that as being a monopoly or an oligopoly in search, that is priced at zero. So they're not even competing in price in the area where they have a monopoly. So maybe we need to start rethinking what antitrust means to us. Maybe we need to start thinking about regulations and laws that underlie our notion of what the economics is that goes into platforms today. And I found this to be true in a number of different areas. And I realized that we need to be thinking outside of our little silos. So I found that there is actually a lot of economic thinking that is being done by technologists. They are creating economics when they create cryptocurrencies or they create these platforms. There is actually a new economics being created. We as academics need to think about what this means in terms of what models we need to create in order to think about the effects of this new technology. We need to be working with the legal structures and the political structures to create regulation that's going to feed back into the technology because the three of us need to be working together in order to be able to create the kind of future that we think we need that deep technology is calling out for. And there's actually a fourth player that I should probably have on here, which is civil society. Because I believe that the, one, the actor that is actually going to push us the most is civil society. And they're already doing that when they start saying, we're not happy with where things are today. We need to see changes. Some of the other areas where I feel like um, these three actors really are thinking about sa the same issues, but are thinking about them from very different perspectives. If we think about the issue of fractionalization, in Silicon Valley, you'll hear about X as a service. So Airbnb is lodging as a service. Uber is cars as a service the sharing economy. In economics, we think about that as shifting from a stock of a car to a flow. In regulator regulatory terms, we need to start thinking about unregulated operators. Crypto. In Silicon Valley, they'll talk about zero trust, decentralized computing. As economists, we need to be thinking about anonymous self-policed game theory. Lawyers need to be thinking about non-recourse contracts. The digital economy, people used to say in the 1970s at the beginning, information wants to be free. Well, from an economics perspective, if you have a piece of music or you have a book, that was a private good. If it's now available for free on the internet, you've just converted it into a public good and you've got a market failure. So as more and more of our ideas start becoming public goods, or as we have 3D printing, we have even more of our design stuff becoming public goods. 
What does that do to our notion of our society, which is based on the idea of economics where, you know, if everything starts becoming a public good, we don't have the same structures that we can rely on, the same models that we can rely on as economists. Automation is the big one that we hear about all the time. In Silicon Valley, the instant answer is universal basic income. It's clean, it's efficient, it deals with the problem, right? As economists, we think in terms of the marginal product of labor. We talked a little bit about this in Ursula's talk yesterday. Does it really mean what we think it means? Under any circumstances, we've always had this notion in a neoclassical framework that the marginal product of labor equals the wage. What if it's just an accident of history that the marginal product of labor for a century, two centuries, more, was sufficient to provide a living wage? What if we're no longer in that space? How do we start thinking about that as economists? Within a regulatory framework, what is the issue of stakeholders and shareholders? At some point, there was an increasing shift towards the shareholder as being king. And INET, of course, has funded a lot of work where we've looked at what is the role of um, the shareholder and who do we need to really think about as being stakeholders in our economy. Um, maybe the time has come for us to change some of our basic assumptions and frameworks. So with respect to the future of work, Maybe rather than thinking in terms of robots as substitutes for labor, we need to start thinking about how do we build robots that are complements to labor. Maybe we need to fundamentally rethink the organization of labor and the organization, uh, um, the structure of our labor markets, and we need to think, rethink our notion of setting wages equal to the marginal product of labor. With respect to economic concentration, monopolies, these platforms, are sometimes called natural monopolies. Sometimes we're looking at QWERTY monopolies. There are barriers to entry. How do we start thinking about this within an economic framework? Privacy, who controls our data? Free speech. At some point within the space of a week, I think Twitter, um, YouTube, five platforms decided to deplatform Alex Jones. Many of us are very uncomfortable with the message Alex Jones puts out there. But are we comfortable with the idea that it is going to be private companies that decide whose message gets out there and who gets to be banned? Who determines what's allowable? So these are some of the assumptions that we are bringing to tech from our old world that maybe we need to start rethinking as we have these deep shifts in technology. To go back to the issue of labor, many of you in the room are familiar with this graph. We've been seeing this for a long time. What is it that really explains the discrepancy, the income inequality that we've been seeing? We've seen many arguments. One of the big ones is automation. But what if there are others that we need to be looking at? We've heard over the last couple of days a fair number of people discuss the issue of unions. There has been a change in the structure of our labor market so that the power of labor looks very different now than it did, for example, in the 1950s or the 1960s. Maybe we need to be thinking in different terms in terms of what it is that we can address to deal with the future of work issues. So as we look to the future, the question is, do we want to be thinking in terms of ridding ourselves of human drudgery or destroying the jobs that our workforce relies on. And I'd like to end with a quote from John Maynard Keynes. The day is not far off when the economic problem will take the back seat where it belongs, and the arena of the heart and the head will be occupied or reoccupied by our real problems, the problems of life and of human relations, of creation, behavior, and religion. And the hope is that if we, if we can approach this proactively, we can maybe build the kind of society that Keynes had in mind. Thank you.